Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today's guest has had a very varied career, which has included working as a teacher, a carpenter, a divorce mediator, a psychotherapist and a psychohistorian. Author of The Making of Them, which was made into a movie, which is available on YouTube. Nick Duffel's book about boarding school was groundbreaking when it was first published and provoked a backlash. Whilst we featured several previous conversations about boarding school, I thought, Nick, when I read your book, that it might have well have been subtitled A History of How the British Dislike Their Children. So <laughs> really pleased to get the chance to have a conversation with you today. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. I just have to correct that about the book. It's actually, um, what actually happened was that I, I got the chance but by sheer chance to write an article for the independent newspaper, which was starting, it was the, the journalist was someone whose roof I'd done. And I was at the end of my training and I, I had this leaflet about the boarding school survivors workshops, which I had just envisaged and are still going today, n- nonstop since the end of 1989. And um, she... So she turned to me and, and she said, this is Angela Lambert, who is a novelist in her own right, since deceased, sadly. She said, oh, I'm looking for someone to write a column about the negative effects of boarding. I can't find anyone. Would you like to do it? Well, would I? So I got the job. And what happened was I got this incredible response from readers. And in those days, this is pre-email, so I had all these letters sent to the Independent and forwarded to me in my tiny flat in London, and they blocked up my doorway, actually. And a lot of, most of these letters were saying, amazing that someone has finally spoke out about this. And lots of letters said, please, can you fix my husband, quick. And other letters said, you know, scum like you should be sent to God knows where because it's so un-British, anti-British. Anyway, so th- then I, I I was just kind of discovering the, the issues with boarding. And, but I I got all this follow-up from, from, from the media and press and lots of interviews. So I had to sort of set myself up as a sort of expert when I was only just discovering it. And it was during that period that I had a lot of documentaries came to me and most people wanted to film workshops. I wouldn't let them do that. And this one man, Colin Luke, was very neutral and clear and he'd made award-winning things for the BBC. And so he made a film that was called The Making of Them. And in this film, it followed a bunch of little boys in their first day. And I still use some of those trips in uh, clips in my, in my training. And then actually I asked his permission to use the, the title for my book, which came out seven years later. So that's the, just, the, Thank you. just the background to the book. So so my book followed this. In in the times of those films, I couldn't have written about it. I didn't really know enough about it. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much for, for making that clear. And I suppose also just to say you have, um, you know, you've spoken lots of times, you've written lots of stuff, and we will share links to all that material uh, when we publish the podcast so that people can can access those. Great. Okay. Hi, Nick. Really nice Hi. to meet you. And I can tell this is going to be one of the easiest conversations I've ever had in my life. And, <laughs> and I love hearing about these kind of multifaceted creative careers that you've just been describing but to crack on how has the boarding school come to be so central to British culture what is it about the British that led to so many children being subjected to this kind well, of education I mean that you see the thing is that's really a complicated question here's let's start with what the simple thing is the simple thing is that we know, and, and, and Naomi will vouch for this, sort of that in in psychology and, and education and, and pedagogy, which we don't really have in Britain, the pedagogy being the, the science of how to raise children, there is not one theory of child development that supports 
taking children out of the family and putting them into an institution. I mean, we know the Spartans used to do it, but we really don't want to follow them in terms of child rearing techniques. So we know that it is um, contrary to 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 how 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 we think children should be raised, and particularly as as society gets more child centered, and so you could say certainly Western European society has become more and more child centered. That it it doesn't it seem like a good idea that you 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 might expect problems from this and and indeed you do you get problems. Second thing is why are the British so keen to it on it? Well, that's a much more long winded thing and and you could say that there was a, a tradition going back to the Middle Ages where sons of noblemen would be brought up in other noblemen's courts. Yeah. That was quite common, and you had these uh, these um, rarefied educational inst- in- institutions like Eton College and West- uh, um, Winchester College, also dating back to the to the, the Middle Ages, uh, which specialised in education for for the very very few, as it was in those days, the sons sons of the aristocracy, basically. Um, and the only other sort of education went on was in was in monastic communities. So, so, um, so you have a situation where at the beginning of the nineteenth century these traditions were there, and then you had uh, what was going on in 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 sort of in 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 the global world that was the Britain was becoming both the manufacturing leader with the Industrial Revolution and the colonial leader um, following in the footsteps of the, you know, the, the, the Dutch, the Portuguese and the Spanish and was starting to be dominant in the world in the beginning of the 19th century. And by the mid-19th century, most of the world was kind of pink, just like it was in my childhood atlases in the 1950s still. So you have this period of British grandiosity, really, in the mid nineteenth century, and they they needed really fast to 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 uh, produce servants for the empire, officers, administrators, leaders for the empire, and they they sort of re um, jigged the the um, the culture that was already in place from Eton and and, and Winchester in places like this. And sort of then they invented the boarding school culture that, uh, as we know it now, and they formalized it under law. They called it public schools because it was supposed to be not just for the aristocracy, but it, but it soon meant that it was really there for people who could pay, even in those days, considerable fees. And it appealed, as it does always, to aspirational middle class uh, families, as well as people going for these careers, and it was it was done in a sort of industrialized process, so that you can interview even today people who have come out of different boarding schools, and they're all actually experiencing their personalities quite similar, you know, and and you could say so when you have the symptoms of boarding school survivors that there is a range of similar symptoms. So it's quite a closed control group, as it were. And so this then continued basically unchanged the, the education methods uh, really up to the, you know, the, um, the time when I was uh, at my British boarding school and, and um, it, it was quite a rigid socialization and there was the, the the learning attitude was i found it very difficult when i arrived because i'd been to an american boarding school first where i did my separation which is in europe full of army people but when i got to the british boarding school i was i was told that i was a stupid child and knew nothing and at the same time i was going to be leading the world leading the empire you know <laughs> 
and already in you know it didn't sort of it was a, a double bind didn't really add up to me so that the, so in in the sort of 50s and the 60s the british boarding school system had been going for a hundred years and was already quite anachronistic then in its methods but was increasingly popular because after the wars the whole sort of class structure in britain began to break down and if you wanted to get your family on the right side of the tracks as my father did who was you know came from east end fa family in hackney and was a worker you could send your son to one of these schools and he'd come back speaking posh it was a brilliant social move and they became very popular again then and it's gone on you know and now you know it's aspirational families who send their children there as well as the traditional sort of upper classes but if you you go into those uh, boarding schools now you'll see there's loads of people from them from the gulf from singapore from places where, you know russians where the money's being created so you're you're suggesting really that the kind of parents who send their children to boarding school come from a a rather sort of um, uh, select kind of group who would be aspirational, but also yeah. those who foresee some kind of uh, pathway towards presumably the major professions. Like well, yes, or absolutely. That's, I mean, and there is that pathway, you know, sometimes we call it the, the old school tie. I sometimes call it the, the golden path to leadership. Because if, if you look at the, 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 how um, leadership positions take take you know, take politics. It's there's a, there's a statistic from one um, uh, one of these um, global um, institutes, which I can send to you if you're interested. Which says that something like sixty five percent of world leaders were privately educated in Britain. So it, 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 it now, you see, it's a global business, but Britain always was global. You see, I mean, the, the British Empire uh, basically, you know, was a globalized thing. It's just everything came back to Britain then. And, and so it, you've got aspirational families from all over the world, from the rising uh, middle classes in Britain. And of course, then the traditional upper classes who, 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 you know, I, I've met people very disappointed that they weren't sent to Eton because all their mates were from upper class places where there was a mother, I remember, who wanted to keep their child at a boarding school nearer their home in Yorkshire. And he was terribly disappointed. He hadn't gone to Eton. And that's, that, that's the sort of the more traditional type because what is happening today is it's, the cost of sending a child to one of these major boarding schools is around about 45 grand a year. So you have to be quite, quite wealthy to, to manage it, I think. I mean, that, that's, that's increasingly the case at the moment. So, so that it, it's increasingly getting um, reorientated towards the, the super rich, I think. Yes, that's, uh, that's terribly interesting though, because what, again, what you're saying suggests that um, it's not so much to do with a parent's attitude towards their children, but it's much more object-driven or objective-driven than that to create a posh-sounding young person or to create a barrister. Or, or yes, so to put someone on the path to success, you know, uh, 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 children of of, of and parents of people who board they don't want to uh, abuse their children or give them a hard time they want to put them they all want to put them on, on the best possible path the, the situation as it is internally in britain it, it, it is i mean this is why it's a difficult subject you see because it, it is not just psychology it's it's politics it's sociology it's education you see what you get in Britain is that these schools are known erroneously as the independent sector, whereas actually they don't pay VAT, they don't pay rates. Um, Robert Fakaik, the, the, the investigative journalist, discovered that it actually costs every citizen in Britain £50 a year to support in, in, in missed taxes and things like that. It's not independent. Uh, uh, the, the, the charities...
And I'm, I'm still just talking about Britain now, but internally in Britain, the, then the state sector, sector takes on a sort of second-class role. It becomes a Cinderella system in relation to this so-called independent system. So, you know, if you, if you're really out for 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 finding the, the so-called best school for your kids, it's girls and boys now, of course. Then, and you've got the cash, then the whole weight of, of, of society's pressure is saying, send them to one of these schools. You know, they've got no distractions. You know, they've got five and a half day study days. They've got all their, all their leisure time is scheduled with activities. You know, they're not going to be hanging around the streets, you know, getting into trouble with crack. You know, they're going to be on, they're going to be hothoused. Of course, then you get to the psychology of it, which I'm sure we'll come to in a minute, is that people who've been through this program find in later life that they can't get off the timetable. They're completely stuck in that sort of mindset. Yes. So you seem to be hinting, and I think you uh, made some reference to this earlier on, that actually there isn't much reflection uh, on the impact of being sent away to a school. It's not something that parents customarily do. They don't think about the impact. Well, that's why it's so weird. It really is weird. And, and um, it's um, he, he, to explain why that is, I mean, you have to think of, of um a process called social normalization, which a normalization anyway is one of the defense mechanisms that Anna Freud named. And social normalization, you know, I think in, in pop culture, it's more called groupthink, you know, that if, if everybody goes along with a certain idea, then it is so. So, uh, so that if everybody says this is the best thing for your children, um, then it, 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 it's it's so pervasive. So you, you have, I've had lots of people telling me about things like this or mothers themselves saying to me, you know, I'm really unsure about this or, or what was my mother thinking about, stuff like this. And the reality is the social pressure not to think about any psychological fallout is so great that, that, that we sort of... Um, we didn't do it. And, and actually, one of the things in, in the more complicated byproducts, I, I, I argue that, that the boarding culture trains people to dissociate anyway. And boarding is a transgenerational problem. You know, we've had 200 years of it. So we, we very easily go into dissociation. We don't speak about it. I mean, it's different. You know, the States is a bit different. They're all in, they're into denial there in Britain we're much better at to say we just we compartmentalize it don't think about it and so the, the, it, it ends up being a bit like you know when you think about this you know, the metaphor of the fish in water do they discuss water uh, no we think they don't because they're just so used to it, it that, that's what it ends up like the real mystery is how come the psychotherapy profession have been so late to get this because when I started my research in, in the late 80s, I couldn't find any psychological references to it. I have since found one or two older ones. But and you looked at the, the, the sort of founding fathers of the British psychoanalytic movement in Britain. I'm talking about Winnicott, Bowlby, Guntrip, Beyond. Uh, Fairbairn, these old people, really big names, all exporters. So Winnicott, come, Winnicott worked 40 years in Paddington Green Children's Hospital, worked with evacuee children. And Winnicott comes up with an idea of the false self. He doesn't think to mention his, his boarding. Bowlby, towards the end of his life, is she, wrote somewhere 
I wouldn't send a dog age seven to boarding school. Not mentioning that actually he'd been to boarding school at seven and he had a terrible time. So it's a real mystery. And when Joy Chavarin comes on the scene in, in, in 2011, writing her very useful articles, she she names all these people who actually did their in their they had full, you know very long analyses, and the boarding never came up. And of course, when I was doing my own therapy, you know, I had eleven years of therapy, my therapist never never uh, picked it up, you know, because um, you know my my first therapist had been a printer first, yeah, so he probably thought, oh, that's a bit posh, I don't want to go near that, I don't get that. So you you get that, but you also get the phenomenon, I suppose, in in the therapy profession that it's a middle class profession. It's run mostly by women. How many of those women had their children at boarding school? Uh, yeah. So this is where you get, you know, when we said it's a simple thing in the beginning, let's let's keep children in families. When you get to the, you know, the full complexity, it's really complex, all this. Yeah, I think you're talking about people who didn't want to know because actually Bowlby and his colleagues at the Tavi did do some extraordinary work, particularly they made some films about separation, children being separate, being left, yeah. really. Yeah. And they're still painful to watch today. Yes. But they, they didn't gain traction for 30 or 40 years, I suppose. No, and it's interesting, uh, there's a... In, Bessel van der Kolk's book, who's very popular these days, you know, the Dutch traumatologist, he took, he writes in, in, in The Body Keeps the Score, he writes about what's it like visiting the Portman Clinic, he was in the Tavi, and he has this insight as he goes in that all these um, British theorists were all um, men who he, I think he describes that they were sort of wrenched away from their families as children into boarding schools. He gets it. Yeah. But, you know, this is this is like, uh, I don't know, what's that, two, 2018 or something? Like, I don't know, 2015, something like that. So it's quite late. So do you think this culture of boarding and boarding school has had an influence across the spectrum of society? And I'm particularly thinking of the kind of care which our local authorities customarily offer to children? Well, I mean, if you speak to social workers, they they um, are very keen to keep children in families, even, even running the risk when there are sort of abusive parents around. So social work theory... Um, is these days all about trying to keep people in the, in the families. Um, of course, that's all changed because we used to have, you know, we don't have the psychiatric hospitals, we don't have the asylums, we don't have the care homes to the extent that we used to. But one of the reasons we don't is because we've moved away from the Victorian attitudes which created all these institutions which both had, you know, a level of compassion in them, but also had this I idea, which is a sort of, go back to the psychohistory now, is sort of more sort of a, a part of modernism, that people could be thought of as commodities, as things, and produced in production lines or exploited, you know, abroad. And, and, and that... Um, that the sick were kind of non-persons and this sort this sort of thing. So those attitudes have been changing. Uh, so, but but where I think it does affect us is certainly in, in educational policy in 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 our in the structure of society because I still think Britain is a very very top-down society where you the way to go is to ape the top. There's, you know, you know the, Keith Richards of Rolling Stone wrote in his autobiography that the the masters in Dartford Tech, where he went, where they, or, or, 
used to wear gowns and mortarboards and like to call themselves dons, you know. Uh, so they were all aping the top. And you look at a politician like Michael Gove. I mean, you wouldn't know he's not a boarding school survivor from his mannerisms. You know, he was adopted by some fishmongers, I believe, you know. And it's nothing against fishmongers. But, you know, I'm just saying how there's a universal pressure to um, to sort of create this top-down thing in Britain, which means we're, we're, not, uh, we're not a social democracy in the way that our European neighbours are. And boarding is central driver in that, I think. Yeah, I think um, I think you're right, Nick. And we interviewed Naomi Fisher about education, and one of the things that really comes across in thinking about schools is how unchild focused they are in terms of some of the policies that happen. You know, if you've got hundreds of thousands of kids in Britain not being educated in school because they can't manage being in school, it tells you yeah. there's something wrong there. But yeah. but also just in terms of observations of how parents talk to their children I think you often hear them you know they talk to children in a way they would never ever talk to another adult you know they might yeah. be humiliating curt irritable don't offer explanations up and I you know I w- I'd wondered how much of that was was shaped by this kind of attitude towards kids then yeah well I mean, society. that's right and you as you know Naomi my, my first book the making of them the subtitle I called it the British attitude to children and the boarding school system, because I was grappling with this question that 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 you asked earlier on is like like why why are the Brits so into this, and you know you know why why don't they have a similar regime in France and Germany and 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 um, and, and the Netherlands, but you know they don't, and you know they use boarding schools. Well, there's some Catholic seminaries and things like that, and there are some sort of schools for people where they're you know, um, where the, the parents are in the Navy or something like this, you know, in extremist sort of versions, but but not deliberately taking out the home. And, you know, in Britain, you you know, you, you find that there are some children taken out of the home and sent to a, sc- a, a, sc- a school five, ten miles away. And the, for the kids to get their head around this, what does this mean? It's very difficult because the border is plunged into uh, really a series of perplexing double binds. You know, my parents say they love me, but actually they sent me away. What, what does that mean? You know, they, I know this is incredibly important to them. It's costing them a shed load of money. And the fact, the, the fact that, you know, could I then tell them that I, actually I don't like it? I'd rather be home and disappoint them. How ungrateful would that be? So the, 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 the complexities then that the border is landed into to try and resolve in his or her own mind are, 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 are very difficult. So there's, 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 it's not surprising that quite a, you know, a, a considerable number of people say, right, this is the best. This is the best for me. This is going to be the make of me. I joined the establishment and I'm entitled to my perks and privileges and you have something which i called in my second book wounded leaders i call it the the entitlement complex the entitlement illusion so that you so so that in in compensation for the loss of childhood family local uh village and and stuff like this you get this entitlement complex which you you can again you see it clearly in our politicians um uh, some in particular, uh, and 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 you get actually uh, people voting for them because they think, oh well, you know these these toffs are born to to rule us. Yeah, uh, we're getting all these recent political disasters we've had right in our face, like you know Brexit and 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 and, 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 and look at the state we're in now, you know it's all led by ex-border leaders, you know. So, And again, yeah. there's a kind of a contemptuous attitude towards younger people, I think, isn't there? You know, if you think about how, you know, what life looks like for for someone just entering adulthood now, as opposed to when we were 
entering adulthood where that we probably have more opportunities available to us but you know things like buying a home having any kind of like security about work all these sorts of things have become increasingly difficult for for people but especially young people who yeah. have resources oh, behind yeah. them oh yeah they'd be absolutely right and and of course partly we we we've we we the, I mean, this is partly because the sort of this incredible bubble of of economic growth since the end of the war, the end of the, you know, since the mid nineteen forties, and, and the Marshall Plan and everything has come to an end. It's partly that, but it's also that with the Thatcher Reagan revolution, then and, and, and it, we've kind of gone back to a much more structured class system so so for example I, when i went to oxford in, in my college i was in a minority as having coming from a public school um but now that's reverted again and it looks like we're heading back to sort of gilded age like end of the 20 end of the 19th century when the gap between rich and poor was staggering you know led to the russian revolution and the first world war actually and it's 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 partly that, but the the psychology of it, my, my sort of thesis is that if you're trained to be a leader in one of these elite schools, and if the first thing you learn when you get to that school is you've got to cut off your feelings of missing your mummy, uh, and not talk about your feelings because actually it's quite scary and there's a group for a other people they're all actually in the same state they're going to be there for perhaps 10 years in this institution you lose touch with your feelings in quite a remarkable way and two things arise from that one is that actually vulnerability in general is a foreign thing that you're disconnected from so Later in life, when you, you're an adult, and if you're, you've gone on the golden path and you're in a position of leadership, it's just not possible for you to connect with the vulnerable. You just don't get it because you've had to disown vulnerability as a child. Yeah. And the second thing is we now know through, and it's one of the reasons it, it's, it, it, it's coming to the fore now, boarding school syndrome, because we've got the the neuroscience and the trauma science coming. We now know from the neuroscience that you've got to have some degree of emotional intelligence in order to make good decisions. And that, that, that through sort of studies of brain lesions and things, you find that people who have had severed their links with the emotional input into their brain can lead perfectly good lives, but their personality changes and they make poor decisions. And it's very interesting. I remember reading an article around the Brexit, the Bre um, just prior to Brexit, I think it was, was Will Hutton, who, who's a bit of slightly left-wing economist, uh, writes for The Observer. Uh, and he wrote an article saying, why is it that uh, the Tory party had made, a, going going back to the Corn Laws, made a series of poor decisions? And I was just at the time reading this research from um, Antonio Damasio in UCLA, who's, who's working on the brain leech and stuff. And I thought, it must be. These are all people could be actually cut off from their emotions because they've, they've all been to, you know, Eaton and Harrow and blah, 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 leading the Tory party going back years and years and years. And, and it, 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 that, that must be the answer that they're making. That they haven't, they can't form sort of values based on vulnerability, based on emotional input, based, based on thinking of people as persons and not things. So they're going to make poor decisions. And, and to pick up on that though, Nick, and, and fo follow up, you know, I imagine then it's really difficult to think about or to empathise with, put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's not like you if 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 you're 
um, cut off in that way. So how does boarding school perpetuate, you know, antipathy towards women and migrants? So, you know, some of these schools were were male only, weren't they? And then opened up to, to girls. I'm just wondering what that experience must be like for girls yeah. entering that environment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could, you could say that the nature of those institutions is that they're quite militaristic uh, and sort of hyper-masculine. Um, everybody learning left brain skills ways of learning to you know to use Ian McGilchrist's uh, model um, deliberately the schools were deliberately um, created to cut the, 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 the child let's say the boy child off from the influence of mother so he could be a good servant at empire you don't want you don't want too much fussing. You don't want too much softness. You don't want any femininity. Interestingly, in, in, in India, the British Rob, the Memsab, never arrived till about 1880s or something. You know, the, the men were living out there without women and getting on perfectly well because after that sort of training, they would. And so, as you say, bringing girls into those Inst those institutions which they started in a bit in the in the 60s when there was an idea of something called progressive boarding came in and they did quite a lot recently because actually the boarding schools they've they, they, you know i say they're anachronistic but their marketing skills are very good and and so they know that cold dormitories and ship bathrooms things don't appeal anymore so you know when i went in the 50s that, that was fine because we had terrible bathrooms at home anyway yeah so that, that it's not going to wash today so no having you know having some girls is a good thing for marketing some of these girls then go in as a handful of girls in school with with with, with 500 boys i could, can't only Imagine what it must be like going through puberty adolescence in one of those places for a girl. A, trying to get your feminine nature mirrored back to you in such an institution and be around all those testosterone field boys. I mean, awful. And I've heard, you know, lots of tales of that. So, I mean, you're asking a wider question about the relationship to, 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 to the feminine and, and for what we get in our work working with uh, exporters boarding school survivors as i i call them is we get a lot of people come to us when actually the wife or the partner has reached her limit of exasperation with the borders exporters difficulties in relationship now generally you could say classically if, if we're allowed to talk about gender gender in this way at all now i'm not quite sure men find it generally harder to enter into relationships than, than, than women. But if you've been through a training of being institutionalized away from your family for 10 years, a training which is rooted in the kind of misogynistic institutions that we're talking about, you're going to find it very difficult coming out. You're going to find family life very taxing you're going to find intimate relationship very challenging you're going to find being in a we very very difficult because actually you were you were alone in a crowd there that's what you learned and the we that you were in which was you and mummy you had to cut that off and you did it, it i mean she your parents sent you but you cut it off because you couldn't keep it going it was too painful so then going into intimate relationship and expecting to behave like a kind of normal person in intimate relationship after such training asks a hell of a lot. I think, I think it's important to make a distinction or to point out, uh, Nick, that what we're talking about has got very little to do with education. Um, yeah. I, I went to a grammar school in, in Watford it was yeah. a very, very privileged 
school. Oh, I think I know the one. It's got huge, huge grounds. Huge yeah. grounds, massive. Yeah, I've seen that one. All kinds of fantastic facilities. Yeah. I totally wasted the opportunity, but nevertheless, yeah. many people gained tremendously. Um, yeah. But, you know, that was the other 98% of the people from the council estate that I went to went to secondary modern schools, which yeah. didn't have anything of the same uh, level of quality. So it's no. it's quite possible to produce good, very good education, yeah. all-rounded education, but it costs money, of course. Well, the grammar schools did, didn't they? I mean, they really did. And... Um, um, you know, that, I mean, these are very, very complex educational, political questions. Um, the thing that that, that you, you could say, the sort of uh, the the boarding school isn't per se about education, as as you as you rightly say. You do have the facilities uh, for. Um, for study and the facilities certainly for excellence in sports and things like that because of the because the time that you're there and the facilities they've got so lots of people go up to universities from 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 public public schools boarding schools with um because of their sports uh, abilities as, as well but there is in that world which is dominated by sort of upper class um attitudes there's a kind of anti-intellectualism so it's not kind of cool to be a swat when you're a boy but in general any kind of nasal navel gazing you know self-reflection intellectual curiosity is not thing um I, I, it's, there are exceptions, of course, to schools like Winchester, which are really, really um, educationally high profile, of course. But, but in general, if you go back to the original pattern, these schools were trying to churn out gentlemen. Gentlemen who had loyalty to the nation and to the class, who would represent Britain. And, and run things and that the, the, the gentlemanly attitude in, included a certain distrust of intellectuals yeah, i don't know if either of you've read simon cooper's book chums which is oh, yeah. about Oxford. very, very and, good isn't it that, yeah. yes it is and that really comes across a lack of intellectual yeah. ability in people and actually how much of it is preparing for a career in politics through through debate, but and also Boris Johnson's biography. I mean that. I mean, I think we can all probably see that. But that kind of like, not really aspiring to be particularly intellectual. No, um, just performative. No, exactly. And and I had the weird experience reading that book, Naomi, when I thought, God, he's talking about the eighteen nineties. But no, he was talking about the nineteen eighties. <laughs> you know, it was so bizarre, and. And right from the beginning, I remember, you know, one of the, the, the one of the big, you know, uh, regrets of my life is that my 2014 book, which is basically written around 2010, that's a, right, that was that 2010 election that inspired me to write another one. I thought I'd finished with boarding school anyway, and I, I'm I'm writing about Boris Johnson in there. And I, one of the things I say is that people say he's a clever man. I don't think he is. I think he's a bully. He smells like a bully to me, having been to one of those schools. And what he's able to do is quote a bit of Latin or the Bible. And then people think he's clever. You know, he addressed the Occupy movement in Westminster Square. And he said to them, in the, in the name of God and mammon be gone. He said, you know, and, and that's only interpretable to anyone who's been to chapel every day of their school lives. You know, that you, you know the language. Yeah. So anyway, my regret is that that book didn't become a bestseller because we could have avoided possibly Brexit and the Boris Johnson uh, regime. <laughs> 
and and I also would have been rich. But so, <laughs> none of those happened. So moving on a bit, Nick, as a self-confessed rebel against the establishment, what differentiates those of you who rail against the authority and those who join it? Well, I when I was sort of working things out about boarding school survivors, I realised there was there was different kinds of boarding school survivors, and that I was a bit of a rebel. So I was, a rebel was one of the types, and the biggest group I called the compliers. And the compliers sort of mantra is, you know, it didn't do me any harm. It's character building. It's the making of me. Blah blah blah. You know, and this is perfectly sensible way of surviving it, keeping your head down, getting on with it, joining the, joining the big group. Absolutely, the the the, the rebels like like me, um, the big problem certainly, uh, as I say to people I'm training to be specialist therapists for exports, rebels bloody difficult to work with because they want to make you your friend. They they they. The rebel throws the baby out with the bathwater, so it's against all authority, because what's true is they've experienced bad authorities in those schools, but then they end up being against their own internal authorities. So, they, you know, they never sort of they generally don't finish projects or make much of the, the, themselves, things like that. But what was it uh, about your experiences, do you think, that enabled you to be that rebel and not just suck it up and yeah. get your head down? And... Well, it's really clear to me now, because I've spent the last few years wondering about this, why I'm doing this. Because to be honest with you, I'm not so interested in, 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 in boarding schools per se. I, I, I had a time when I thought I had to be a teacher and I, I thank my lucky stars I turned away from it because I, I couldn't manage it. It was just, it's, it's too difficult very difficult uh I, I think it's because i went to my first boarding school which i was at for three years i was in the american section of a school which is located in switzerland my parents were living in germany it was full of american army personnel and the whole regime was really um very benign um it was lots of sort of we made up our own activities you know we went and played in the woods or, or we hung hung out hung around you know and, and by the time i sort of four years later by the time i got to my public school in britain no you weren't allowed to hang around you had you know there's always some activity you had to do there was this attitude to uh your knowing anything that i described before and there was all these rules, this plethora of rules, you know, you can't have your jacket buttons undone until you're in the sixth form and all this sort of stuff, which is incredibly self-referring as well as there was in my day, corporal punishment. You could get beaten for being rude to a senior boy, you know, stuff like this. And I arrived at the school and I thought this is bonkers. It, it doesn't add up. Now, I couldn't put together why it was bonkers or, 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 or what to do about it because I, I spent my time in a bit of a fog and I was a, a timid rebel there but um, it wasn't you know it, it, and then after after boarding school I went to, to um, Oxford it wasn't something I wanted to do my house master's idea and then I went got a job in India and the it also seemed to me weird in India. So why did why do people why are they so nice to me? Why do they respect me? I know what we've, we've done to to them. It took me years and years to put it together, and it wasn't until sort of the late eighties when I was had a series of breakdowns myself, and I was in my psychotherapy training. I, you know, I hadn't wanted to be a therapist. I went on psychotherapy training because I fancied a woman on that I met on an introductory course. That's why I did the, the training. And it wasn't until I was in, the, in that world and uh, working in sort of men's groups and things like that, beginning to work, I realized actually there's something about people who've been exporters, a bit like me, who, who actually can't really join the gang and get on with things. And it started there.
So it started, you know, in myself, and then, of course, my difficulties in my own intimate relationship really made me understand certain things, you know, painfully, slowly, um, uh, that, you know, I that I had learnt uh, not, I, I learned it perhaps not as, not as effectively as some of the others because of the first, the first um, non-English boarding school I went to, I had learned that actually it was, I, I, I mustn't be vulnerable. I mustn't be incompetent. I had to really disown those qualities, except in a sort of joking self-effacing way. That was the sort of British style. And I learned how noxious that can be in intimate relationships because it means the, the way dissociation works, it means that if I'm dissociating for those qualities, it works a lot better if there's someone around who can carry them. So my wife could be the incompetent one. My wife could be the stupid child, this sort of stuff. So we were always polarizing like that. And, and luckily I had a, a wife who wasn't willing to accept it. And so I had to gradually realize what I was doing. And I, I saw that's kind of, this seems to be universal amongst exporters. In fact, a lot of us are attracted to people who seem on the outside rather vulnerable. And um, the, actually the, the training, the dissociation training that gets you through the boarding school, starting from the day one missing your mummy stuff that I spoke about earlier, is absolutely poison in an intimate relationship. Well, we, perhaps we can move on a bit, Nick, and you can tell us a bit about what you do now. What do you think are some of the tasks for therapy with the sort of people we've been talking about? Right. Well, um, we started workshops uh, for exporters in 1990 was the first one, and they've been running continuously, and that's that's a workshop spread over two weekends, so four-day workshops, quite intense. Two facilitators on these rooms, smallish groups, and and um, they're still going. We also run them for women now because um, it started out just thinking about boarding for men, but there are lots, as Naomi said, the women who sent to boarding school, girls are sent to boarding school, and it affects them very badly because they're sent into these hyper-masculine places. Uh, and over the last sort of 10, 15 years, um, I've been training others to run those workshops and training um, individual therapists to work with exporters. And I do a training which I call the unmaking of them. And I do that for four modules. And and um, that's very popular at the moment. So it, it's, I think one of the reasons is that in the last few years, as I've said through um, Joy Chavarin's work, my colleague Joy Chavarin, who's um, come at it, the, the issue from a sort of Jungian perspective and, uh, and um, the, the 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 rebirth of attachment therapy is now a big deal. It, it, we thought in, in my day we thought it was common sense, but it's now really uh, come back. The traumatology and all the resources we've got now, and the neuroscience, and you know all the work of people like Stephen Porges and Dan Siegel, and that sort of looking at the the impact on of the long-term effects of complex trauma, developmental trauma, long-term habitual dissociation. We, and that's all now measurable. So what's happening is people are very interested in this now and people realize, and, and exporters are turning up for therapy and people realize that how bloody difficult we are to work with. So, I mean, and I say exporters are one of the fastest growing client groups in the country but they're very, very challenging clients for all kinds of reasons. And people have to actually really um, learn 
how to work with them. So I run a postgraduate course for um, uh, for therapists doing that. The next one is starts next year in 2025. I'm happy to say people are already signing up for this because so there is a lot of interest in it. Same time, my own in my own life, the the only um, I don't have a practice, so I don't work with exporters, but I do see kind of a handful of couples. And I like to keep my hand in a little bit there and keep in touch with what people are dealing with because it changes a bit. And, you know, as his naming read out, I, you know, I started uh, really as a divorce mediator. That's how I got into this field, mainly because I was guilty about my own divorce. And I've been working, uh, doing couple work for many years and I, I, I like couple work and I think it's a way of of really making an impact quickly into people's lives and um, this year we're running a, a training for a couple it starts in May so if you if people are interested in that please get in touch and there's still some places and um, because that's another four weekend training um and and the, the the connection between those two is, is i think that both working with exporters and working with couples you've got to be a, a lot more um willing to sort of uh, make interventions it's no good being a blank screen it's no good just asking people how they feel and of course a lot of the boarding material actually gets revealed in couple couple sessions actually we uh, uh, lots of boarders come in because of relationship problems as you know in the way we've discussed and why wouldn't they because they had this really poor training for intimacy and so it's right that things sort of collapse at a certain point it gives a chance to relearn and um so a couple therapists uh will have to learn to manage both couples which is hard enough and exporters so exporter in couples yes yeah, um, quite demanding <laughs> we will share links in our show notes and also yeah. when we put the transcript on substack we'll put connections okay. the links to your, right. to your website but just conscious of the time nick and it it sounds like your attitude towards your well-being in the first phase of your life might have been quite different to how it is now and i wondered what have you learned and what advice would you share with our listeners about well-being my own well-being well, yeah, I think but exporters, one of the symptoms of exporters, certainly the rebel types, is very poor self-care. You know, so we were sent to sort of, as it were, Spartan institutions. And, it, you know, it's said that exporters can manage things like prison quite well. John McCarthy, who was a hostage, said he wouldn't have got through it if it hadn't been for boarding school training, stuff like this. But that, you know, that becomes a habit, very poor self-care. And little things like, you know, I know in my own life, you know, I used to not make my bed. And when I reflected on this, I thought, oh, yeah, you, you, know, you know what you're doing. You're, you're waiting for a mummy to come make your bed for you or a mummy substitute stroke partner. Yeah. So... Uh, it was, you know, it's a perverse thing because also I also got to sleep, sleep in rotten beds, you know. Uh, uh, so when I started to take that on and think, of, I mean, you know, if my partner hears this, she still thinks I'm bad at it. But I would then consciously make the bed for me when I start to really get there. And, and you know, like this is worth doing, you know. Um because I suppose deep inside, a part of you believes that actually you, you're not actually, you, you're supposed to be this uh, entitled figure, but actually you're just a worthless child, really. And, and that's the double, the d sort of deep interior um, conundrum that the boarding does to people. And... and uh, you, you know, your parents must have got rid of you because there's something flawed about you. So 
you have to start to see you see through all this you, you know it takes time it's painful you have to grieve it you know and, and then maybe you, you come out and treat yourself a bit better thank you nick thanks i really enjoyed having this conversation with you thanks for sharing so much me too thank you very good hosts both of you thank you thanks a lot no we could have gone on for hours i think oh so. yeah ab ab absolutely great <laughs> okay so I'm